You can start, Tiffany. Okay. All right. So thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Professor Anne-Marie Madigan, who's going to uh, be our colloquium speaker today. Uh, so Anne-Marie got her undergrad in physics and astronomy from the National University of Ireland in Galway. She got her master's and PhD in astronomy from Leiden University in the Netherlands. And she was a NASA um, Einstein postdoctoral fellow and a TAC fellow at UC Berkeley after that. And in 2016, she became an assistant professor of astrophysics at CU Boulder. And uh, she's a, a Jilla fellow in Boulder. Jilla or Jilla? <laughs> Um, and she was awarded the Packard Fellowship in uh, 2018. She's an expert in the dynamics of eccentric bodies, in particular related to black holes and dark matter um, and small bodies in our outer solar system and exoplanets. And today she's gonna to tell us about how collective gravity from many individual small bodies may explain the structures that are seen in our outer solar system. Um, so uh, for all the attendees, please keep yourself muted during the colloquium unless you have a question and you may ask a question during the colloquium if you'd like. You can just unmute and ask your question, um, but if you prefer, you can save it until the end and we should have um, plenty of time at the end for questions. So take it away, Anne-Marie. Okay, so thank you so much, Tiffany, um, and thanks everybody for uh, being here today virtually and um, for the opportunity to talk. So I'm gonna be uh, focusing solely on a single project that I've been working on for many years and that's collective gravity in the outer solar system. And so um, since I've become tenure track faculty, obviously I'm not doing any of the work myself anymore. Um, so I do wanna highlight some of my group that's really been leading this work. Um, the first is Alex Adaric, who's a graduate student and he's really the, the star of the show for this talk, um, but I also have um, three postdocs, Maria, Angela, and Alexi, who have been um, really wonderful bringing different expertise into the group um, and helping us understand what we're seeing in our simulations. Okay, so let me get started straight away with uh, why I'm interested in the outer solar system, what I mean by the outer solar system, uh, and why there's something interesting going on out there that needs an explanation. So what I'm showing you here is a simple schematic showing a uh, semi-major axis on the x-axis um, in AU, going from one to a thousand AU, and eccentricity of the orbits of bodies on their y-axis, going from zero up to one isn't more, so you know what I mean. Um, so we've got the giant planets here, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all very circular orbits. Uh, we've got little Pluto that has a, an eccentricity, but Pluto is of course not actually a planet. Um, it's part of the Kuiper belt, this distribution of icy bodies um, around the orbit of Neptune going a little bit beyond. So the next um, group of bodies I wanna talk about is the scattered disk. And so these are bodies very similar to the Kuiper belt, but they, they show some structure in their orbit. And so what you'll see here is they move outwards in semi-major axis, they, they move upwards in the orbital eccentricities. And this line that I've plotted indicates a line of constant perihelion. So perihelion of an orbit is the distance in the orbit that brings you closest uh, to the star. So the reason the scattered disk objects have constant perihelia, more or less, is because they're in the outer solar system. And when they go near perihelia, they go near Neptune. And this is preferentially when they get uh, gravitationally scattered um, and jump to uh, a new orbit. Of course, when you jump to a new orbit, you can't actually physically move um, from one position just to another. You, you change your velocity and move on to a new orbit, but you still maintain um, that position that you, that you know, thinking of an impulse proclamation, still are uh, conserving that perihelion distance where you were, you were most likely to be scattered by Neptune, which is why then, oh, and I have an equation here. Um, when we look at perihelion, um, it equals semi-major axis times one minus eccentricity. So if you're conserving that quantity when you get scattered by Neptune, as you move outwards in semi-major axis, you have to move upwards in eccentricity. So this is why you get this line. So I focus um, so much on the dynamics or the structure of the scattered disk because of what we see um, further outwards in the solar system. And these are bodies that are not well explained um, with the, the current setup 
of our solar system as we as we understand it with no new new objects so far. Um, these are called detached objects, and they're I'm showing them here. They're between about 100 AU and 1000 AU, and these bodies have really large perihelia distances. So they never come close to the orbit of Neptune. And so we don't understand how they got there, right? So if they were scattered outwards by the giant planets, their perihelia should still be touching the orbit of Neptune or one of the other giant planets, but they're way too large. So this needs an explanation. Now, that's a very simple schematic in some image access space and eccentricity. I just want to give you a, an idea of the scale of these bodies and their orbits. So I'm showing the innermost solar system now. And we have the four innermost planets. We've got the asteroid belt and Jupiter. And we're going to move outwards. And we have um, the giant planets and then the orbit of Pluto that's in purple. And then in the top corner, you'll see Sedna. So Sedna um, was co-discovered by Mike Brown in 2003. This is one of the detached bodies that, that really needs an explanation for, for its location in the solar system. And you might think, you know, I'm sure because Mike Brown and Constantine are right here in Caltech, um, I'm sure you've heard about Sedna, but for people who may not be um, working on the outer solar system at all, you might think Sedna's orbit might look a little bit like Pluto's, just kind of larger semi major axis, but something that looks a bit similar. Um, this, though, is the orbit of Sedna. And so it's really elongated, it's extremely large semi major axis, so its orbital period is over 10,000 years. Um, so that, that, that looks interesting, you'll see that large perihelion distance. But where you really start to see things becoming very interesting is if you consider a bunch of these orbits all together. And so this is what I'm showing you here. Um, this is from a nature paper by Trujillo and Shepard in 2014. And what I'm plotting here, x-axis is semi-major axis. And so you're taking a bunch of those detached bodies um, with very large perihelia in their orbits. And you're plotting them alongside an element, a Kepler element we call the argument of perihelion or omega. Now, I'm going to explain exactly what omega is on the next slide, but just simply it's, it's how your orbit tilts with respect to the ecliptic. Does it go like this and this, or does it go like this and this and this? Um, so you would expect in the outer solar system that bodies have just been scattered outwards that these omega values would be pretty random. And that's what we see up until about 150 AU, and then you can see some noticeable clustering of bodies. Um, so I wanna, again, point out Sedna. This is where Sedna lies on this plot. And you'll also see 2012 VP113. I really like this body because it was, um, well, one of the reasons, because it, it was discovered in 2012 when Joe Biden was vice president. And so everybody in the field calls this object Biden. Um, I guess it will get an official designation at some point. Um, I don't know if it will catch though, because we really like Biden. Okay, so I, I said I would explain what this little omega means and why is it interesting that bodies would actually share a common value of this Kepler element. Um, and to do that, I like to um, think about uh, going from Kepler elements, which is all about like rotations of orbits with respect to reference directions and reference planes, um, and actually just think about vectors. So we've got an orbit here, major axis and a minor axis, and we've got semi-major, oh, we've got the angular momentum vector, J, which tells you the, the normal of the plane or just the orientation of the plane, and then eccentricity vector points from the focus of your ellipse, so the sun in this case, and goes out to the perihelion um, position of the orbit. And its magnitude equals the eccentricity of the orbit itself. So these two vectors will tell you really nicely your orbital plane and then also how your orbit is actually directed. Okay, so now to compare it and to go back and compare these quantities to the Kepler elements, I'm gonna use a boat. You can also use a plane if you'd like, but we've got a boat. And if you imagine a rope going around the outside of the boat, um, and that's your orbit. So kind of like an elliptical boat shape. So we've got a major axis of a boat, we've got a minor axis of a boat, and there's three rotations that you'll be quite used to. Um, there's a pitch, forward or backwards. There is a roll, left or right, along your, your major axis. 
And there's also yaw, or just redirecting uh, the nose of your boat over your eccentricity vector. So omega, at least for small rotations, uh, you can show mathematically, is basically how much you're pitching divided by how much you're rolling. And these are angles here. And so if you have a whole bunch of omegas, or a whole bunch of boats or orbits with similar omegas, you're basically saying that no matter where these orbits or these boats are pointing in the sky, for example, for one omega value, they're all rolling to their right and they're all pitching forward. So that gives you an idea of how strange it is that no matter where these orbits are actually pointing, they're all doing this thing a bit up. Um, the other angle that's um, interesting to know for this talk is that uh, omega with a bar over it, sometimes I call it pomega, I'm not quite sure actually what, what this angle is meant to be referred to. In LaTeX, it's var pi. Um, but this is the yaw. So if, when you see this omega with a bar, pomega, this tells you where the nose of your orbit or your boat or your plane is pointed to. So if orbits, for example, had very similar pomega values, they'd all be pointed in the same direction. So that, that's going to come up. OK. so. In the interest of time, I'm going to summarize some of the rest of the, the unusual minor planet mysteries. Um, so we've already gone into some of these minor planets are detached um, and that they have perihelion much greater than the orbit of Jupiter, of, of, yes, of Jupiter, but uh, also Neptune, which is at orbiting at 30 AU. Um, I haven't gone into this, but some of them have extremely high inclinations that are difficult to explain also with just scattering of small bodies outwards into the real outer solar system. Uh, there's clustering in little omega, this is the, the tilt, and there is clustering in physical space, meaning the orbits are actually all pointed in the same direction. And I'll, I'll show you an image that, um, that explains what I mean in the next slide. So, um, there, there are a couple of different theories for what could be causing all these minor planet mysteries. And we should say, we're, like, we don't see this in uh, the Kuiper belt, for example. We don't see this in the asteroid belt. These are, these are pretty um, new and interesting orbital features of bodies in the outer solar system that really demand an explanation. Okay. And so the first idea is, of course, that there is um, a super Earth in the outer solar system kind of between that range of 100 to 1000 AU um, on an eccentric orbit. And it's gravitationally interacting with these minor planets and forcing them to have this structure. And so um, I'm taking this from the press release in 2016 by Constantine Apatigan and Mike Bryan. And so in purple, we're showing the orbits of some of these bodies, the most dynamically stable bodies in the outer solar system. So they, they, they're, they're really, really very much detached. They're not in any mean motion resonances with Neptune. You'll see here, we have our friend Sedna and we also have Biden. Um, and so the explanation um, started with um, Constantine and Mike is that there is this planet nine in the outer solar system. And again, I think the, the most up-to-date parameters that really explain the orbits of the minor planets is a planet nine is like a super Earth sub Neptune um, icy planet, kind of a centric orbit, like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, um, on an inclined orbit with respect to the ecliptic and um, with a semi major axis that's a few hundred AU. Okay, so that's, that's one explanation. It's a very popular explanation. Um, and it's really exciting because it's. Uh, it, it gives us a really nice prediction. Um, we should see this planet if it is there. And of course, many groups around the world um, are looking for planet nine, taking new data with the best telescopes in the world. But also there's lots of citizen science campaigns looking at archival images, trying to actually um, find evidence for this planet. So what I'm gonna propose for the rest of this talk is that they're all wrong. And I, I can't see any faces, so hopefully everybody is like, oh, it's a nice way to put it. And not like, um, but the, my proposal here is that it's actually minor planets self-organizing. So if there's a sufficient mass of minor planets, uh, they will be collectively gravitationally in influencing one another, and they can actually um, reproduce all these features and and actually some more in the outer solar system. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. So before I actually get to showing results of simulations and explaining how this all works, uh, I want to have a couple of slides just on the dynamics. So um, I'm going to be talking about collective gravity, like these, these small bodies that are individually low mass interacting with each other and producing some really interesting dynamical features. So usually when we think of bodies interacting with each other, we might think of gravitational scattering. So the two bodies, they would just go straight past each other, but if they feel a gravitational force or acceleration, the orbits are deflected and it's a very strong deflection given in this little schematic here. This is often referred to as two-body relaxation. It's pretty analogous to scattering in a plasma. It's very diffusive and doesn't generally lead to um, very rapid instabilities in the system. What I'm very much interested in is secular dynamics. So in the previous example of two-body relaxation, um, we just had some random particles move and some like infinite sea of other particles. But if you place these bodies, in the potential of a massive object. So this could be stars around a black hole, or these could be um, minor planets around the sun. Then the orbits are not just randomly chaotic moving through the system. They're quite predictable, right? So they're gonna be on these almost closed orbits in the schematic. Um, the orbits will open out um, just because the fact that they're not in a, a perfect Kepler potential, but there's some other things tugging them. And that's called precession, that orbiting out of their orbit. Um, but in this case, it's not important that these bodies have actually ever get close to each other and have a strong scattering event. It's that they are going to be repeating the moving on the same path again and again over long time scales. And so that gravitational force that you're feeling, even if it's small, will build up and build up every orbital period. So as a conceptual device, it's sometimes used as a computational device. Um, I like to think about a time-lapse uh, photo of this system and say, okay, look, we're going to see the light of that body spread out along its orbit. And the, the brightest part, or equivalently the most massive part of this orbit, is going to be at apocenter, or furthest away from that central body, because bodies slow down in this region, and um, they, just, they spend more time. There. So that's where most of the mass is located in these ellipses. And so these now in the time lapse sense or orbit average sense, these ellipses, massive ellipses, are going to be pulling on each other. And mathematically, what that means is that you are going to be gravitationally torquing each other. So the two equations I've got here, they'll come back up later, is the angular momentum of a body on one of these orbits. The specific angular momentum is r cross v, radius times velocity. And the torque, which is the rate of change of angular momentum, is given by r cross f. And so if you know the angular momentum of your body, just like this 3D vector, and um, you can look at one of these orbits and say, well, at apocenter it feels this force from this direction, you can, uh, in, in a talk, not in uh, your actual work, but in a talk, in a hand wavy sense, you can get an idea for, well, is the torque aligned with the angular momentum vector? Is the torque anti-aligned? Is the torque going to actually rotate the orbit because you're moving the angular momentum vector in one direction or not? So I find it, that's quite useful. So these, these equations will come back up if I'm explaining anything. Okay, so I'm gonna show you um, some and body simulations. And uh, this stuff um, that I'm gonna be sharing is all on published work. And what we've done here is simulated a primordial scattered disk in the solar system. And we've included the orbit average influences of the giant planets. So I say primordial scattered disk because we vary the mass of the scattered disk that we use in the simulations. Um, and we don't just stick to the current mass of the scattered disk, which is extremely low. And uh, the orbit average influences of the giant planets, that's really important. Uh, it's really <laughs> computationally um, extremely difficult to put the giant planets in as point particles, um, but including the orbit average effects gets to um, really the main, um, the main kind of contributor to, to the secular dynamical effects. If you have, um, the giant planets uh, in your n-body simulation, 
they're going to cause orbits further out to process rapidly. Um, so open out their orbits really quickly and also differentially process with respect to one another very rapidly as they go outwards in semi-majestus. So they're really important to include. Um, and, and, and you'll see, you need to get to a very high mass of this primordial scattered disk to really overcome um, that differential precession. But then, but then you get exactly what you want. Okay, so what I'm showing here, and if there are any questions, again, just like you can, you can shout up. I'm showing um, the evolution of this massive scattered disk. Here, I believe the mass in the scattered disk is 20 Earth masses. So again, this is like um, early solar system. Leftover planetesimals are being scattered outwards. That's that's what we're thinking. It's not that we think there's 20 Earth masses in the scattered disk today. Um, you're going to see on the left-hand side an edge-on view of the system, and on the right-hand side, you're going to see a top-down view, a face face on view of the system. And I'm just looking at the innermost edges um, because the particles get, get too few in the innermost edges to actually see anything uh, much above the noise. So we're looking at the surface density evolution. The time scale is given in units of the secular time. I'll explain that in a, a, a couple of slides. Basically, if you think one secular time is almost a, a little bit more than a million years, maybe two million years. And so the simulation will run for um, somewhere between 500 million years and a billion years. So let me get started with the left-hand side. And uh, before I show you what's going to happen, just a reminder that if this wasn't a scattered disk, if this was a disk of bodies on pretty much circular orbits or just slightly eccentric orbits, you would expect to just see this disk to get puffy. Okay, so let's, let's show you what you see when it's the scattered disk. So here you'll notice that the orbits have begun to go like this. This is that um, clustering in omega that I was talking before. They're all kind of bending down in the same direction. And they all actually tilt in the same way during that, that time. So we call this effect the inclination instability in 2016. And that's because it is actually an instability. The bodies interact with each other and um, cause their inclinations to grow exponentially. Uh, and they get to maybe 60 degrees um, in the disk in inclination. There's lots of variation there um, before the instability saturates and, and we get some other interesting dynamics. So now let me play the face on the view. And you might notice the system looks like it kind of shrinks a little bit. And what we're seeing here is that as the orbits incline off the plane, um, just conserving angular momentum, what happens is that the orbits actually interact with each other and get more circular and decrease in their orbital eccentricity. So what I'm going to do next is just show you them side by side so you can see how they actually um, map onto one time scale together. Nope. There we go. The other thing I hope you notice that the the yellow, um, the yellow colors indicate the highest density, and so, for example, if you just take this last frame, you'll notice when we're looking face down onto the disk, the yellow is not evenly distributed around the disk, and so this is actually an upsidal clustering. There are more orbits pointing in the same direction, and then you would expect from an axisymmetric system, and this is very much a function of the semi-major axis of the, of the minor planets in the system. Okay, so if there are no questions, I'm gonna just show you a, a few uh, plots where I've divided the minor planets into semi-major axis ranges to kind of see like where, is, where are these dynamics becoming most important? Where are they shut down due to the giant planets, for example? So you can see all the plots straight away here, um, but I just want to highlight first the inclination. So we've got four lines corresponding to different semi-major axis ranges. And um, we've got the median values for bodies in that range. So we've got inclination here in radians and the blue line 
is the innermost edge that we've simulated. So these are bodies in the scatter's disk going from about 100 to 150 AU. And you see they, they do actually start to undergo this instability, um, but it's very jagged, it's very noisy. And the, the reason for this is that these bodies are differentially processing with respect to one another very rapidly um, and moving so fast that it's hard for torques to build up on their orbit if orbits keep moving too fast. Um, if we go to the next line, this is the orange line. So it actually undergoes the instability really nicely, still a bit noisy, um, but on average, the bodies in this range reach a really high inclination. And again, uh, these are just the median values. There's a very broad range here. So some, um, some minor planets do get left behind and stay at low inclinations, and some actually go to retrograde orientations, just a few. Um, then we have, the green line, that's 250 to 550 AU, and that actually undergoes the instability best, um, just in, in the sense that it actually reaches the highest inclinations out of all the bodies in the system. And then the red line follows. Um, so this is the very outermost edge. The, the, the reason the red line is not as big as the green line is just that the, the orbital time scales increase so much that those bodies don't have uh, as much time to experience all these torques acting on their orbits before the whole system's kind of jumped off the plane. So the green line, this region of like 250 to 550 is really where you see um, the collective gravity acting the strongest in the system. Here's the eccentricity evolution. You can see um, very similar type of dynamics going on here that the blue line is kind of suppressed in this evolution and much noisier than the rest just because of uh, the influence of the giant planets. Um, what I would like to point out though, are the bottom two plots. So what we've done here is taken the eccentricity vectors of all of the minor planets in the simulation um, and taken the, the unit values and added them all up. And so if you just had an axisymmetric disk and all the eccentricity vectors were um, pointed randomly in the system, just axisymmetrically distributed, you would expect that uh, the Z component of this sum would just average to zero. And that's what, what you get initially. But the you, you reason you see this kind of curve is because of that kind of coherent motion where all the orbits start pointing upwards and then pointing back downwards as they process. And so that's really the, the key feature of the, this inclination and stability. Um, you'll notice even the stars in the innermost edge, um, even they follow this, this kind of wavy pattern going like this. But uh, some of the newest work really is looking at that apsidal clustering in the plane. So this is ER. So this is adding up all the unit eccentricity vectors of all of the bodies, and then looking at that in plane component. And so if they're all axisymmetrically distributed, you know, we should average out to zero. But if you get some clustering, you're going to get values. And the maximum value you can get with this statistic is one. And so you see that even the innermost edge in this case actually has quite significant values, particularly around the, like, the 400 mark. That's 400 secular times. Um, and also the, the, the semi-major axis further out. So going out to like 150 to 250, that orange line is becoming significantly clustered. I find it interesting that it looks like the green line might be getting there further away. Um, we could talk more in question time about uh, how we feel about this plot. Um, but one thing to note is that these simulations are computationally expensive and because all of these bodies have to be gravitationally interacting with each other. There's no test particles here. And so we're really limited in the N we use in this N body simulations. And what we found is that as we go upwards in N, do not be horrified by the numbers here. We'll have an updated plot in our, our next paper, um, but this is what we have right now from 2020. Um, when we look at the a measure of the strength or persistence of apsidal clustering in the system, um, it grows with the number of particles we put in the simulation. So if keeping the same mass in the system, by just putting in more particles, so dividing the mass better amongst the particles, you get um, stronger and more persistent apsidal clustering. 
And the reason for this is pretty straightforward. So if you have too few particles in your simulation, and yes, 100 is too few, um, two body relaxation is um, or too powerful in your simulation. So these orbits, uh, the particles want to move on these nice smooth orbits and persist due to the mean field, but it's got an absolutely massive neighbor that keeps scattering it and, and shoving it um, sideways, whatever. So the, the torques are not as strong between orbits because of this artificially high scattering. Now, what we'd really like N to get to is a billion. Um, we're, we're probably not gonna get there anytime soon, but we're increasing to two values of about a thousand. And we see this trend. Um, sorry, my daughter is quiet in the background here. Um, so we do think if we keep going with the N, um, if we were to get to something more realistic, like 10,000, 100,000, getting to a million, we would see this um, upsidal clustering really persist. And that's well motivated by a paper that was recently out by Grusinov, Levin and Shu, um, where they, they're looking at this type of stuff in a very different way. Um, they're looking at like statistical thermodynamics of particles in a Kepler potential. And they show for a rotating system, um, it, with many different initial conditions, the equilibrium state of the system should be lopsided. And so they, they're looking at the M31 nuclear disk and kind of talking about that type of system, but the, they should also hold for the solar system. I had a question. Yes. Are all the particles assumed to be of the same size, same mass? In these particular simulations, yes, they are. So we. We've looked at that before, and there is actually some really interesting stuff if you have different mass particles. Um, but for everything I'm showing here, just everything has the same mass. Is there a good reason why you can make that assumption of that all these little things that are formed at t equals zero should be narrowly confined in mass? No, not at all. Um, no, this is this is purely for us to see kind of like the bulk dynamics, um, but but we have looked at what, what happens when we use a distribution of masses or an extreme um, between two different masses, um, and there are some really interesting things that pop out of that. But this is this is all very new, so we first want to <clears throat> present like the simplest um, setup. A question about the time scale and mass, just looking at this slide. Um, the 20 Earth masses led to numbers where the actual time elapsed is hundreds of millions of years. Am I inferring <laughs> that if you were to make the mass of the disk, say, 10 times less, you would get the same effect, but it would take 10 times longer? Or do you not know? So, yeah, if you... If you do not include the influence of the giant planets, that upsidal precession that they cause, that's exactly correct. You'll get exactly the same dynamics, but your time scale will just change. Um, and you see the equation, it just, it just scales linearly with the mass ratio. But if you include the effects of the giant planets, all of a sudden, uh, if you have too low a disk mass, the instability actually does not occur at all. Um, okay. so the critical, dynamics can be quite different. So there's a critical mass. Do you know the critical mass? It's 20 Earth masses. <laughs> oh, so you have to be at 20 or above. Yeah, it's a, it's around 20. Um, it, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much 20. Um, the simulations are tricky, so I can't, I can't, I, I would say there's a factor of two variation in that. Um, but yeah, if you suddenly drop down to one Earth mass, this isn't going to work. Okay, uh, I can't. I can't. Um, see Amory, can I ask a question? Oh. Yes. Oh yeah. Sorry. So so I mean, in addition to causing the upsidal precession, the giant planets will also actually scatter the scattered disk, right? And that's going to deplete the scattered disk pretty rapidly. So do you, is that, does that not cause a problem where your disk mass, even if it's initially high and 20 earth masses may be, you know, reasonable for the first, I don't know, 100,000 years, but then it goes down real fast. 
Yeah, that, that's, that's an excellent point. So what we see in our simulations is that um, even though it's slow to see on the plot, unless I plot it in a log axis, the collective gravity of the scattered disk particles immediately start um, to lift the inclinations and to pull the, um, the perihelia back of these bodies <clears throat> because their eccentricities are getting smaller and so their perihelion distance gets larger. And so the collective gravity of these bodies, even if there's not a sufficient amount um, to, 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 to fully undergo like a, a proper instability, um, it acts to actually move the bodies away from the giant planets. Um, and so it, it's not that you're going to get a scattered disk and for a hundred million years, the, the bodies are still being scattered very strongly. The perihelion will instantly start to, to pull away. And so you'll still get scattering events, but they will be less and less strong. And so combined with the fact that we have way too few particles in our simulation and the two body relaxation is al already way too powerful in these simulations. Um, it leads me to still think this is, this is something um, that will happen in the solar system if you have a sufficiently massive disk in the scattered disk initially. Um, I know that's a bit of a, it's not a very like precise answer. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how we're going to be able to answer it if we're still stuck on these really small end simulations. So getting a better code would be really good. Okay, I'm gonna um, show this plot and move on from, from this particular simulation. Um, so what I wanna show here is the perihelion distance um, of orbits uh, in the scattered disk. And so initially you'll see they, they all start off at about 30 AU um, and by design, that's, that's where we place them. And as the instability kicks in, because the inclinations grow so rapidly and the eccentricities drop so quickly that, that their perihelia pull back, they get much, much larger. Um, and you'll see that the innermost edge of the disk, that's that blue line, it pulls back the least just because of that upsidal um, precession due to the giant planets. And the outermost region, that's that red line, um, also does not pull back quite as much. But the yellow and the green line, so that's the range of going between, um, sorry, Alex, Alex made this plot, so the, the ranges are a little different from the previous plot, but it, talking about like 150 to 200 AU going into about 500 to 600 AU, they undergo the instability really nicely. And so their perihelia all jump back very far. And this creates uh, a gap in semi-major axis space, right? So if, you, if you're at lower semi-major axis, your perihelia will not be as large as if you suddenly go outwards in semi-major axis space. And all of a sudden your perihelia is, is much, much bigger until you get to the very outer regions again, and they're a little bit smaller again. Um, so this really, depends on um, the, the initial mass in your disk, exactly where this gap is, and, and a lot of different initial conditions that are, that, that are well motivated in our simulation, but could definitely vary depending on the early solar system evolution. Okay, so I'm just adding that in here. The, um, there is actually an observed perihelion gap for bodies in this region, 200 and 600 AU. Um, it's really low number statistics. The gap is kind of bounded by lots of bodies on one side of the perihelion gap and then two on the other side. So I'm not gonna to focus too much on it, but it is really interesting that this instability actually creates a perihelion gap once you simulate it in the, in the scattered disk with the influence of the giant planet. So our prediction is that if, what we're seeing in the outer solar system is due to the collective gravity of minor planets out there, we need a very massive disk. So this would be a, a new Kuiper belt. Um, for want of a better word, it wouldn't look like the Kuiper belt. It would be much more massive, especially initially. It would need to have about 20 Earth masses, minor planets. Um, and right now, uh, we have not detected anything near that size in the outer solar system. Um, it would also 
in other ways, it wouldn't be like the Kuiper belt in that it would be very much lopsided. You'd still see that upside little clustering. Um, the other things I wanted to say here is that this is um, too much mass for a lot of solar system people. There, there was indeed like maybe 20 Earth masses, even more 30 Earth masses of planetesimals left over from the formation of the planets and they would have gotten scattered outwards. You form the Oort cloud. Um, to me, I'm not so worried about this mass because I'm coming from um, a field of like stellar dynamics, galactic dynamics, where collective gravity of individually low mass and collectively massive um, groups of bodies are, that's what causes structure like bars, like spiral arms um, and things like that. So it feels, um, it feels analogous and it makes sense that we would actually see some interesting structures in Kepler systems, right? So in the outskirts of uh, solar systems where you're far enough away from giant planets um, to, to be um, constantly interacting with them and differentially processing, but you're not so far ahead in your solar system or your planetary system that passing stars are just whipping you from the system. So if, if you want to define structure due to collective gravity in a planetary system, this is where you would look for it. Uh, for bodies with orbits of about a few hundred AU. Okay, um, so I, I want to just uh, focus on the last few slides on why you get the orbital clustering in the outer solar system. Why do we see this in our simulations? Um, I'm not going to explain why we get the inclination instability, because that's some uh, previous work that we had out in 2018, but this, this stuff is new and really excited by it explaining that side of clustering. Um, so we come back to those two equations. So these are two things we need to know to explain the clustering. So first is that these orbits of minor planets in the scatter disk are going to exert gravitational torques on each other. Um, and you can see what that torque is. So that's R cross F term. And the other thing to note is the angular momentum of an orbit is um, related to the square root of one minus eccentricity squared of the orbit. So basically, if your angular momentum increases, your eccentricity is decreasing. You're getting more circular and something to point out. And the second thing is that normally, and I, I use that word on purpose, circular orbits process faster than eccentric orbits for the same semi-major axis, right? So this is a little image here of an orbit processing. If the orbit was more circular, that speed at which it processes or opens out would be faster um, than if the orbit was more radial. And uh, I, I worked with a, an awesome undergrad a couple of years ago who, um, when I told him this, was like, oh yeah, it's exactly like kayaks. If your kayak is more squat, more circular, it's going to be easier to move, so like, or, or yaw in, in this language. But if your kayak is like a kilometer long skinny thing, it's going to be really hard for you to turn it. So that's like the normal way we think of um, orbits processing as a function of their, their angular momentum or eccentricity. So why do I use this language? Well, there's a, a wonderful paper by Lyndon Bell in 1979, where he's um, explained the formation of bars in disk galaxies. And um, let me do a very quick overview of Lyndon Bell's mechanism. Let's say we have a disk galaxy and we introduce a bar-like perturbation, so some kind of oval perturbation, and it's composed of stars moving, in this case, counterclockwise along the oval. And so that's its velocity vector. We're looking face down onto the system. And we can ask the question, well, if I have another orbit nearby, uh, will it want to join the perturbation and make it stronger and grow into a bar, or will it want to move away from that perturbation? So here's our, um, orbit that's nearby. These uh, orbits, they're moving in the frame, processing or co-rotating with the bar-like perturbation, but they're both going to um, open out in this direction, the clockwise direction. So what will happen? Well, we can use our equations. We say the angular momentum of this orbit that's going to be perturbed by this bar-like potential is just r cos v. So r cos b means the angular momentum will point outwards out from um, this Zoom meeting. And the torque it experiences though from the bar, you can calculate from r cos f. 
So it will be positive, meaning the torque will actually be in the same direction as the angular momentum vector. And so the angular momentum of this orbit will grow, which means it gets more circular. And normally when you're more circular, you process faster, you open out faster. And so this orbit, due to the torque it experiences from the bar-like perturbation, will actually move away from the bar. And so you wouldn't expect structure to grow. You wouldn't expect to get a bar in a galaxy. Um, okay, so this is this is what uh, Linda Bell was saying. Normally, orbits torque each other such that they actually move away from each other and you don't get the growth of such structure. But what he showed is that in some parts of a galaxy, eccentric orbits actually process faster than circular orbits. And it's all about the density distribution of bodies in your galaxy. So he's looking at the isochrome potential. Um, it's a, a nice potential for a galaxy. You can look at analytically. And he showed that there's a region in this galaxy near the center where there's an abnormal region that eccentric orbits actually process faster than circular orbits. And so uh, the, the torques are the same, but the reaction is exactly the opposite. So you'll be torqued such that you actually slow down and the bar perturbation catches up with you and you actually um, grow that bar-like perturbation. And this is a way to actually make the bars and galaxies bigger and bigger and bigger if you have an abnormal region in your galaxy. So what has this do, to do with the other solar system? So we thought this was, we thought this was great. And so I asked Alex to make a plot. Here we've got semi major axis on the y-axis here and then eccentricity on the x-axis. And I've got um, this scattered disk particles um, early on in the simulation before the instability kicks in, just along this line. This is the line of constant perihelion position. And Alex has overplotted in blue this normal region. So he's populated the simulation with lots of test particles to see, you know, how do they process um, as a function of their eccentricity? Do they process faster or slower if you get more eccentric? And it's noisy towards the inside where you've got these circular orbits. It's because of all the, the influence of the giant planets, really. Um, but as you move outwards, it's all the normal region. But mid instability, when you've got this kind of bowl uh, potential formed and you've really changed the density distribution as a function of radius in your system, you've got a very large abnormal region. And uh, again, those black dots are where the particles actually are at that stage. So all that those particles that are like less than 0 0.6 in eccentricity, they all live in an abnormal region, meaning if any of their orbits start to overlap, they will torque surrounding orbits such that those orbits will actually process towards them and grow the perturbation. And so we think we're seeing Lyndon Bell's bar formation mechanism um, at work in, in our simulations of the solar system. Um, the other things to say here about it, I've totally forgotten. So maybe if somebody asks me a question, I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay, so there is no need for a planet nine, Constantine. I've been saying this for a while. You're not surprised I was gonna come to this conclusion. If there was a lot of mass in this primordial scattered disk in the outer solar system, we're asking for a lot of mass. And I really think that's the Achilles heel. Uh, I was hoping Alex would turn around and tell me the answer was like an Earth mass, um, or at least, you know, cap it at 10, but he came back with the results that like, kind of need about 20 Earth masses. It's a lot, uh, and it may be too much. Maybe this is not what's going on in our outer solar system, but um, I think it's really exciting that we can explain a lot of what's going on in the outer solar system, um, just with self-gravity alone, with no new planet, um, nothing new needed in the solar system. Uh, the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to come online next year, uh, which is really exciting, and start taking data um, a year later, and we'll be able to, to discover um, this disk of material uh, left over if it's still if it's there, uh, or indeed Planet Nine if it's not yet discovered before then. Um, and so, what we're working on in my group right now, which I'm really excited about, it, is finally getting to the stage with our simulations that we can start making proper predictions for the Vera Rubin Observatory. Like what, what is the structure of this disk? What should it look like today? And so I'll leave it there. Um, I'm excited to see your faces again when you pop back in and uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emery. Thanks so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, do we have any questions? 
Can I ask one uh, one more? Is that, so in your model, the the lopsidedness of the disk itself, right? That uh, that you see. If I understand correctly, that's not actually the KBOs, right? It's the disk that's then slightly eccentric, which then forces the actual scattered disk to assemble into a into a upsidally confined configuration. Is that right, or or is the observed scattered disk just a high eccentricity tail of of your massive disk? I understood the last sentence, so I'll I'll reply to that, and you can tell me if there's there's something else I should talk about. Yeah, like um. Basically, the, the current scatter disk we see today, and this is just objects that are, <laughs> sorry to be so dismissive of like the current scatter disk, like, but who cares? You know? But this is just bodies that are currently being scattered by Neptune that could have, you know, more recently undergone a, a scattering and now be scattered outwards. Um, this primordial scattered disk, um, it, you know, have this structure and it, uh, it would be uh, very much detached and lopsided. Um, there will be internal secular torques. And so bodies will still oscillate back and forth in eccentricity. And so <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting to your point now. I think, yeah, like when they when they oscillate back and forth across this this upsidely aligned disk, they will get back to the current scattered disk. Okay. Yeah, they should, they should, right? Yeah, it would be like the high eccentricity tail will kind of rejoin them. Um, and it's also a way of actually like being a reservoir of material of like cometary material I like to keep kind of moving into the, the inner solar system. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have a question. Um, Sri, I think you still have your hand up, but I don't know if you have a new question. Uh, no. It's... Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and we have Joe. Yeah. Hi, this is Joe Lazio. Thanks for the many intuitive uh, explanations. Um, returning to the question of mass, is this what happens if the if the if this disk loses mass? Does the instability freeze in, or does it damp? Would it damp out? Um. So if the <laughs> it's a great question, but it's there's many parts to it, right? Like you'd have to think, like, how is it losing mass? If if it undergoes the instability, meaning that you know it, the the orbits really have that exponential growth and inclination, they will detach while they do that. So um, they, so they're kind of isolated, and so losing mass will probably depend on just internal torques. And as Constantine was alluding to, like kind of bodies entering the scattered disk again. Um, they'll be fine. Once you start losing mass that way, because the bulk of the mass is so detached from the inner solar system and the outer solar system, um, it, will, it will keep self-propagating. It will keep just processing um, as a lopsided disk. That's, that's my intuition for it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? You can raise your hand or just unmute if you'd like. It looks like Greg has a question. Hey, Emery, great talk. Any intuition on what the mass distribution would be for this um, other belt at lower masses? Would it have the same kind of collision evolution you'd see for the Kuiper belt, for example? Again, a bit like Constantine, I think I understood the second sentence, but not the first. Um, it's a, so if I answer backwards and maybe we'll get to your first point. Um, I think the collisional evolution is fascinating. Um, I basically, I think it's a whole separate project to try and understand when you have orbits, particularly undergoing the instability um, and only intersecting um, at smaller radii. I, th I think it will not be obvious what the um, like what what is the dust distribution that you're going to predict, I think we look extremely different from what the end body simulations are showing. And so maybe it would look more circular. Um, am I getting even remotely close to what you were asking? Yeah, I'm, I'm just kind of curious if you expect the same ratio of like sub kilometer to 100 kilometer objects, basically. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So this would all be 
at least in the picture I have in my head, all these bodies that are out there would all have come um, from the same distribution as like the scatter disk today, it's Kuiper belt today. So I would expect very similar mass distributions in, in the structure. Um, so somebody did ask, and I wasn't sure exactly who, how will this all change, but I do actually in the simulations put in a mass distribution. It, it does change, but they were like very simple simulations that I was running, trying to get these simulations now in the scattered disk with the upsidal um, precession due to the giant planets could, could introduce something interesting, differences and in, depending on the masses of the bodies. But I don't know, I don't know that yet. Awesome, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Jim. Hi, I'm Ryan. Thanks for the great talk. So it sounds like you're predicting something like 20 Earth masses of material out there. What is the typical semi-major axis of those bodies? Is it a few hundred AU? Uh, yeah, that's bad. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I think there are some theoretical papers like Duncan Tremaine and somebody, somebody will know this paper, um, to show me that scattering process produces uh, a certain power law as a function of semi-major axis. Um, so with, what, whatever they're producing, it's gonna give you a, a particular mass range. Um, I would say the innermost edge of this structure though would have to be at about that like 100, and maybe even like 250 AU where you're gonna see a lot of these detached bodies kicking in um, inwards of that range. Um, they're not. They're not going to be. Um, they're going to look like um, kind of scattered disk objects, or you know, so the perihelion plot. Basically, their perihelion don't jump up as high, and so we probably already detected some of these. Okay, so these things are presumably going to be at a couple hundred AU, but they're going to be really small, like Pluto or smaller. Is there so? They're going to be very faint, right? Can LSST actually detect these things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we should think about them being like little Sednas or Bidens, mm -hmm. um, but LSST will be able to see further. Um, and see, see down to a, um, <laughs> I'm trying to say a better magnitude. Like observational astronomy, it's either high or low. You guys always have it reversed. A better magnitude. Um, so we'll be able to see more of these things. Uh, I would, what we're predicting though, it's not like 20 Earth masses still has to be there right now because um, we, we see eccentric disks of bodies in, in other Kepler systems like galactic nuclei and you have stars around black holes, supermassive black holes. And you do then see the, as orbits process across the disk structure and back, they oscillate in eccentricity. And so you will be losing um, some of this mass back into the solar system when you go to a high eccentricity and you become a, a cometary body, for example. Um, but I don't know quite how much mass you would expect to lose over um, a few billion years. So I'm, I'm anticipating lots of mass there if, if that's what's going on in the other solar system. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, do we have any final questions? We're just at the hour, so we're right on time. You can raise your hand or unmute. Okay, I'm gonna say that uh, it looks like we're done with questions. So thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Uh, really appreciate you giving a wonderful talk today. Um, and I'm gonna pass the mic over to Andrew Howard for the faculty uh, meet and greet after the colloquium. And thank you everyone. If you wanna unmute and do it,